So good afternoon and welcome to this uh, conversation on the future of uh, EMU. I guess we are at the time in this conference where we uh, can reflect on everything we've uh, heard and uh, learned over the last uh, day and a half and uh, pull, the, pull the threads and uh, weave the threads together and, uh, and uh, make it something uh, useful for the future of EMU. We're here to discuss the future and we're not here to discuss the past. Um, and uh, it comes at a, uh, I guess, at a uh, topical uh, moment where uh, finance ministers uh, last week and uh, prime ministers and uh, leaders uh, tomorrow will uh, also reflect on the future of uh, EMU. Uh, and uh, it's also an opportunity for the panelists to comment on uh, what has been achieved so far in terms of deepening EMU, but uh, more importantly, uh, to discuss what more should be done uh, to make the life of the ECB uh, easier. So we have a fantastic lineup. Uh, you had all the names and functions and uh, we uh, know all speakers and we are very, very grateful that they could be here with us today. So uh, without due delay, uh, Gita, can you start it? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and to participate in this. This is my first time in Sintra, so this is a very beautiful place. <laughs> okay, so to jump in um, very quickly uh, on the discussion of the future of the European Monetary Union, I will center my remarks around three broad issues. The first is about heterogeneity that remains and how problems get amplified by it and what needs to be done. Second is about the reforms that are still required. Uh, and while many of us understand some of the broader, broader issues over here, maybe I will narrow down on a few uh, specific uh, prescriptions. Uh, and this would require reforms not just uh, at the union level, but also at the national level. And then I will finish up with a, uh, a discussion of the international role of the euro. So just as, just as a flavor of uh, where we're going, certainly there is heterogeneity, and that heterogeneity uh, remains. If you look at this chart here on the left is the euro area, you look at the unemployment rate, you had this big increase in un uh, divergence in unemployment rates uh, soon after the crises. Some of that has come back uh, down. Uh, and while the average level of the unemployment rate in the euro area uh, is back to you know, uh, record levels, uh, so uh, the employment rate is, is, is high at this point, uh, you still see uh, significant divergence uh, across some countries in the euro area. And on the right, you have the US, and you, have, you see the dispersion on unemployment rates over there. And you see, similarly, there was an increase in dispersion uh, following uh, the crises. But that dispersion has pretty much uh, disappeared uh, or narrowed uh, again back to its original level uh, in more recent time. So for me, there are two things to take away from this. One is, of course, the classic textbook uh, understanding that when you're in monetary union and you have one policy uh, to affect my, uh, regions that are hit with heterogeneous shocks, there's only that much you can do. And there are limits to uh, uh, solving uh, all of the problems. Uh, but the second thing also is that uh, monetary policy uh, can't solve all of this because there are structural issues over here. There are structural differences across countries in the labor markets, uh, in their product markets. Uh, and those, in the absence of those reforms, uh, you know, the, the success of the monetary union uh, will, will not be as good as one would, uh, would like it to be. So I like to keep both of those in mind. Uh, and this is a picture that maybe some of you have seen before, but it also highlights the fact that uh, alongside this, uh, this heterogeneity and divergence, there's a low degree of risk sharing. Uh, and again, if you compare the risk sharing channels in the US and Canada relative to the Euro area, in the US and China, as uh, US and Canada, uh, right after the uh, uh, crisis, so this is from around 2000 uh, post-global uh, post financial uh, crisis, you certainly saw more risk sharing that took place through uh, capital markets, uh, 
uh, and through a lesser extent through fiscal transfers uh, in the US and in Canada uh, as compared to the euro area. So what that means is that uh, if, you are, if you live in a, in a part of the, of the euro area where uh, unemployment rates are high or, and uh, incomes are low, you are going to also be uh, living with uh, lower consumption. So there's very little risk sharing that is going on. Uh, now, something that was less textbook about heterogeneity is that while, yes, it, we all know that one policy for diverse uh, regions is, uh, is, is difficult and, and constrained, uh, I think what was less appreciated that even the transmission mechanism can become highly heterogeneous uh, during uh, a, a crisis. And so we saw that early on uh, when you have uh, the, uh, when the ECB started cutting interest rates uh, after the uh, global financial crisis, but you see that if you look at the lending rates between uh, different parts, you know, Germany, Spain, Italy, France, and if you compare those, you certainly see an, an, an opening up. Now, it is uh, a high point of uh, the ECB's work that solutions were, were found to fix these problems. So the, uh, the t litros uh, certainly helped in uh, narrowing those gaps uh, uh, earlier on. Uh, and you see that if you look at the column of the uh, histogram on the right, and you look at each of those countries, you look at Italy, uh, you see the kind of the blue portion relative to the white portion, which means basically Italy and Spain took up more of this particular channel of financing as compared to, say, France uh, and Germany. Now, the red bars are the newest form of, uh, of uh, long-term refinancing operations. Uh, and that, of course, is trying to fix a different problem. It's trying to uh, take care of the possibility of uh, a liquidity, potential liquidity crisis that, that uh, one might need to worry about uh, going forward. So, of course, that comes, moves uh, very quickly to my, my th third form of uh, heterogeneity. Uh, and the fact, I think there was much less appreciated at the start, uh, again, of the uh, EMU, uh, and more generally in, in our textbooks, was the importance of having a lender of last resort. And so again, this is a classic figure, um, and it's, uh, of course, it was very tempting for me to put it out as uh, President Draghi enters the Central Bankers Hall of Fame. I think this is, this is a classic uh, uh, a picture that we will do whatever it takes to, uh, to save the euro. Uh, and that's a lesson to be learned, that is clearly there's a need for a lender of last resort. Uh, it continues to be the case that debt levels are very heterogeneous uh, in the European Mo uh, Monetary Union. Now, of course, there are sometimes problems with debt levels that have to do with fundamentals, in which case monetary policy should not play a role. But there is also circumstances under which there are problems with debt levels that have to do with liquidities. Uh, with uh, runs in markets, with market failures, and in those situations it is important for a central bank uh, to step in. And so that has to be a lesson that continues uh, going into the future, and, and things will be done about that. Okay, so that was a very quick overview of the heterogeneity that we're seeing, and I'm gonna jump in quickly into uh, what needs to be done. So let's start with what, the, the, the one area where already work has happened, and that's in the banking union. So I'm not going to go into, everybody here knows obviously the details of uh, what has been done so far. I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to make a point that in the absence of having uh, a common deposit insurance scheme, the, you know, the, this, the, I cannot see sufficient progress uh, being made in the banking union. So it has to be that uh, a, an important act, next act, will have to be coming up with a common deposit insurance scheme. Uh, we, there is, needs to be a credible backstop, and by credible backstop, it has to be credible in two ways. One, it has to have the money for it, which is sufficient, but two, it also should be deployable very quickly. So both of those features need to be there for it to be credible, and that's an important part of it. Second, uh, on capital markets union, where there's lesser uh, been done so far, but this is hugely important. Uh, we've done work at the fund on uh, figuring out what are the main uh, issues with, the, with having a common capital market in the euro area. Uh, and we highlight three fe features. One is insufficient transparency, which means that if you look at reporting standards in terms of how uh, firms report, uh, there, there is not enough uniformity in disclosures. So one could make an argument for having a common minimum disclosure requirement. Uh, 
<clears throat> Secondly is having a minimum standard for insolvency. There is a great deal of heterogeneity in insolvency regimes across the euro area. And again, one should argue for having a minimum standard for it. Uh, and third is uh, a, supervised, a centralized supervisory power for non-bank financial institutions, uh, which is again, can generate some uniformity. Now this is of course imp uh, very, use very important for many reasons. Uh, there are certainly needs to be a diversification away from firms relying very heavily on bank financing to other forms, sorry, bank financing to other forms of capital uh, financing. Uh, and secondly, we certainly uh, could use to have more safe assets in, in the euro area, and this would be one way of creating AAA securities. Lastly, I, I suspect the, the piece that's, that's the hardest to bring about, which is the central fiscal capacity, but it can't be emphasized enough. Uh, we are living in, uh, in, in a world where the outlook is, remains precarious. The possibility of a, a, a downturn uh, is, you know, not, while not imminent, certainly uh, is not that far off either. Uh, and therefore, it's very important to have a, a macro stabilization tool in the euro area to deal with that. To the extent that union-wide reforms remain a, a, a political, political challenge, uh, I think in the meantime, it's very important for countries to undertake reforms at the national level. Uh, you have to build resilience, so some new work that we came out with that we just uh, put out uh, a couple of days ago, points out that countries that did do labor market and product market reforms at home had greater resilience to the shock. So there is evidence that that works and, and it should be done. And once again, you know, when you say a labor market regulation that uh, uh, reform, that doesn't mean uh, you know, just one size fits all deregulating the labor markets. It doesn't mean uh, making it less friendly for workers. There are very many models for it. There are the Nordic models where you have a very strong unemployment insurance net. You have a, the, uh, a great support for uh, people to find jobs. But at the same time, you have uh, flexible labor markets which reallocate uh, resources. And that's very important. So lastly, I, I'm in negative uh, time duration now. I'm just going to jump into the international role of the euro. So this is a figure that comes from the most recent uh, analysis that was just put out by the ECB. Uh, two things to point out is one is that there was clearly a period from around 2005, 2006 onwards where you saw a decline in the international role of the euro. That seems, and there is an uptick now. Uh, I mean, we'd have to wait and see uh, whether this is uh, signs of a, actually a reversal in trend because some of this is a reflection of uh, central banks around the world using their dollar reserves to defend their currencies in 2018. So, so it's, going to take, it's going to take a few more data points to see whether there's been a reversal. But I'm just going to end with my absolute last slide, which is the fact that, uh, so, so this is work that I've done, which tells you that if you want to internationalize a currency, and uh, you really have to work on, all, on multiple fronts. Uh, a currency's role in trade, in finance, and as a reserve asset complement each other. So this is a simple picture that shows you that countries that rely very heavily on dollar uh, invoicing in their trade, and this is, I'm looking now at countries that you know, are, are not dollarized economies, but countries that rely heavily on dollar invoicing in their trade uh, are those that also have uh, a greater share of their banking liabilities that are in foreign currency are in dollars. So you see dollarization of, their, of the banking sector. And once you have dollarization of the banking sector, then of course that gives the central banks a very good reason to also be dollarized because if you had to pick one currency to defend uh, your financial markets, you would be, you would be, that would be the currency that's uh, the pr predominant in the banking sector. So these three things come together. So we would have to have uh, a push for more euro contracting in trade that would then spill over into, into uh, finance and into trade finance, and that would then uh, spill over into, into central bank reserves. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Geta. So we'll come back to the international world of the euro with Marcel later on, so we'll have opportunities to uh, dig deeper into this. And uh, meanwhile, uh, let me give the floor to Martin. Oh, and by the way, it's maybe, it may be time to disclose one thing, which is the reason why you have so many jokes about time becoming negative, that we have this big clock here, which you don't see, uh, which is normally green. 
Uh, and when it reaches zero, it turns red and negative. So that's why uh, all speakers are making jokes. And, uh, and there is no zero lower bound, but there has to be an effective lower bound, I guess. <laughs> Martin. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Future of EMU. There is a temptation to talk about the long run, but there is this quote from Keynes about the long run. And in fact, one of the questions about EMU is whether it's going to reach the long run. And the risks to the existence of EMU, I think, have played too little of a role in uh, the past two days. The rise of populism, which is partly anti-EU and partly anti-Euro, must uh, be a cause for thought. And the underlying problem is that politics is local and national, and the source of political legitimacy is, again, local and national. We heard about the first 20 years of the Euro. One thing I find striking is that the first 10 years were a period of depolitization of monetary policy. One was talking about inflation targeting or two pillars and things like that. And the second 10 years were a period of repolitization of monetary policy uh, along nationalist lines. I will focus my remarks on issues involving banks. We like to talk about the need to eliminate, to cut the nexus between banks and sovereigns. I'm pessimistic that this is ever going to come to a conclusion. The problem is this. Banks are essential to the monetary system. Banks are, are also an essential part of national political systems. From the perspective of the ECB, banking union was needed in order to get control over an essential part of the monetary system. That enabled, to some degree, the ending of the procrastination on how to deal with banks in trouble. In 2012, on the occasion of the long-term refinancing operation, I sometimes said, weak banks are wonderful for national politicians because they provide an indirect avenue to the print printing press, which of course creates an incentive to keep them that way without cleaning the system up. Uh, the SSM as a device to aid the cleaning up, has been a remarkable success. Except bank resolution doesn't work. The single resolution mechanism is not viable. And it isn't just the question of the fiscal backstop. It's also the simple problem of a need for liquidity during the resolution procedure. And that's a need even if you don't wind the bank down, why are you sorting out the alternatives? Banco Popular Español had to be resolved overnight through a sale to Santander because there was no liquidity. Now, if we are talking about liquidity in the case of BNP Paribas or Deutsche Bank, we are talking about a quadruple digit billion number, which of course would be polit politically infeasible as, say, a task for the ESM. The backstop for final losses would be much lower. But uh, we don't have any arrangements for these purposes at all that are really workable. I think reform in the area of resolution is really needed. Can we help to break the nexus? Well, in 2002, the Swiss municipality of Leukerbad was insolvent. It didn't get any aid from the canton or the Swiss confederacy, and the bank didn't want to provide more loans. Can we imagine the president of the French Republic to be placed vis-a-vis -vis BNP Paribas in the position of the mayor of Leukerbad vis-a-vis 
the banks. I simply cannot imagine that. And the same would be true even of many of the minister president and the heads of the regional governments in Germany. Influence and power over banks has, as a tr in tradition, been regarded as a major element, in particular in Europe, as a major element of national sovereignty. And there are many more avenues to exercise that power than just supervision and resolution. And the sovereigns so far are the centers of political power and political legitimacy. From their perspective, banks are important and are political because they are a source of funding and money is a tool of power. The German Landesbank can provide an example. It may be a wonderful field for fantasies about industrial policy. National champions think about the uh, recent endeavors to have a merger of Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank uh, initiated by the Berlin Finance Ministry. Think also about the French bank murder, merger some 20 years ago. It's important for voters and in this context, we must mention the fact that the, the outcome of the Italian election a year ago was dramatically influenced by the experience of bail-in in the case of various Italian banks. Investors are voters. Sometimes the large investors may be even more important for voting power than the small people whom we think about for deposit insurance. And uh, the power of investors is one of the things we need to keep in mind when we talk about the politics of banks. Thinking about EDIS, I think, focuses on really the smaller part of the problem. In Banco Popular Español, it was the municipalities with large deposits that ran. And I have a suspicion that the authorities in Madrid were not even unhappy about this, because if Banco Popular Español had gone into such trouble that these municipalities had uh, gotten losses. That would have been the real scandal. From the sovereign's perspective and from the populist voters' perspectives, BRRD, SSM, and state aid control are all intrusions on national ter territory. And we need to think about the politics of those intrusion. The problem is reinforced if the ECB uses the power that it has over the funding of banks, in particular in emergency situations, in order to exert further influence over national policies. Ireland and Greece provide instances of that. At some level, all this means we, need a need, we have a need for a supranational source of political legitimacy, which basically means a stronger parliament and a stronger executive. A budget just by itself is not going to help, especially if the budget is just seen as a device for distributing money rather than a device for doing things. We have enough distributional conflict already. Underneath all this is a really much deeper ch challenge. The past 10 years have taught us to think about these matters in terms of real estate bubbles inducing banking crises that overtask the sovereign, or in terms of sovereign borrowing leading into all sorts of problems. Sort of misbehavior that through suitable controls before, one might actually get under control and eliminate. But going back to the discussion of this morning, if you ask what has happened in some of the instances, take the case of Northern Italy, the banks that were involved there. We're talking about changes in comparative advantage. Shock, asymmetric shocks, this morning we heard about the role of competition from transition countries 
competition from China. And that creates changes in uh, economic activity in these areas. And the regional drought that's induced affects not just the real economy, but also the banks. And to the extent that the banks are regional banks, they're ill-diversified against such shocks. And the governments. How to deal with all that? It's a task for supervision and resolution to clean up and regional policy, and then also perhaps national and EU policy. In the US, the risk sharing that Gita referred to has a lot to do with the fact that national spending is an important stabilizer. I actually once heard a talk by the Swiss defense minister about the problems of Swiss defense policy. And the entire lecture was on how they were using their spending to provide for fiscal equalization across cantons. That's in even that relatively small scale. In the US also, mobility provides a very important way out. West Virginia may be a problem, and the Rust Belt may be a problem, and they vote for Mr. Trump. But there are lots of people leaving. The problem of radicalization in, the, in Rust Belts, including northern England, northern France, Saxony, and I suspect also parts of northern Italy, is of course a major problem for our political systems right now. Underlying this is the problem of capitalism, how to deal with the vagaries of economic development in open economies subject to technical changes, including those that occur elsewhere. To some extent, this, this is an old story. We've had this with coal and steel, we've had this with textiles before. But then there is a question of governance, who is in charge of this, and how does this relate to the financial sector and to uh, monetary policy? Switzerland is an example where most of this is handled at the cantonal level in a very decentralized way. Germany has some of that as well. Uh, and I mean, the Neue Länder are the, the accession lender are the example that proves the rule, largely through fiscal federalism. But we need to find ways to come to terms with that. The legitimacy crisis, which is induced by these vagaries of economic developments, is sometimes a crisis of Brussels. That's what many of the interested parties say. It's also a crisis in the very centralized states, such as UK or France, of London and Paris, perhaps also Berlin and Rome. But the underlying issue is what governance do we develop in the EU context to deal with that kind of problem? And it's not a question of transient shocks asymmetric transient shocks. It's a question of asymmetric structural shocks which are there to stay where some of the ability to adjust must be at the regional level and the extent to which that works depends on incentives that we have even at the regional level. Thank you, Martin. So we've gone into the depth of negative time, but I guess that's because you were talking about Switzerland, so it's okay. Uh, Helen, please. Thank you very much for having me. I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about uh, three topics which have been alluded to in various times uh, yesterday and today. First one has to do with external imbalances within the euro area. The second with uh, macroeconomic stabilization tools. And I will have brief thoughts on uh, monetary sovereignty. 
So you've seen this graph before. It's about the URA current account imbalances, and there are two clear phases. The first one between 2003 and uh, the Great Financial Crisis and the URA crisis, where we have divergence. So we have, in particular, in the lower negative uh, territory here, we have Spain. Uh, we would have uh, Greece, Ireland, and and then after the URA crisis, we have a compression of uh, domestic absorption in the periphery, and we have a set of uh, very important uh, current account surpluses in particular. So in the positive side, you have uh, Germany and, and, and the Netherlands. Now, a reflection of these current account imbalances, of course, is uh, the net international investment positions of your area country. And so here I have singled out in yellow uh, countries with very, very negative international investment positions. You have uh, Ireland, south of 100% uh, uh, in terms of GDP, Greece, uh, you have Spain, and, and Portugal, for example. And on the positive side, uh, you have, uh, again, Germany, Netherlands, uh, for example. Now, I would argue that the first set of imbalances uh, was uh, already so uh, an existential threat for the EU area in the sense that uh, what we have seen during um, the period 2003 to 2008 was the risk buildup with uh, large inflows into the periphery correlated with uh, uh, large asset valuations, uh, real estate bubbles, and uh, we all know the story, crisis, uh, risk premium going up, the doom loop uh, in full play, and finally intervention of the ECB. But the second set of imbalances, so this uh, second phase we are currently in and looking forward, uh, it also uh, causes an important threat for the, for the euro area. And, and there, um, as mentioned by uh, Olivier and by Ricardo, for example, uh, the way to um, rebalance, to get out of that, has to be through a change in relative prices and the real appreciation of, uh, of Germany and the Netherlands. So that has to happen for an inflation differential, uh, for example, Inflation above 3% in Germany and the Netherlands for a while and, and below 2% in the periphery. This is exactly how the euro area is supposed to work. This is nothing special. Uh, tran from a tra transitory point of view, this is how the relative price has to adjust. And uh, I guess this is how it should be also understood by, by citizens in, in various countries of the euro area. Now, why is it important to have rebalancing and uh, to, uh, to take a look at these excess current account surpluses? Because uh, there's a number of, external, uh, of negative externalities which come with, uh, negative, uh, which come with these uh, current account surpluses and the period of too low inflation uh, in the core that we are uh, living through. So one set of negative externalities is purely to do with uh, deflationary pressures in the periphery, depression of aggregate demand, negative effect on debt sustainability, given that we uh, exit the crisis with uh, high levels of nominal debt, so this matters. Uh, there's a slowdown of relative price adjustment uh, because of a low level of, uh, of inflation in aggregate, which makes the area more fragile to shocks. And excess savings put downward pressure on the real rate, uh, knowing that the monetary policy is already close to the effective lower bound. I would add that uh, uh, we also uh, could ha get some more random uh, tweets correlated somehow with the size of bilateral surpluses, uh, putting us uh, more at risk of, uh, of higher trade war. Now, in absence of, uh, of additional tools, uh, what needs to be happening is expansion of aggregate demand and, and inflation higher than 2% in, uh, in core countries. Uh, it is often uh, claimed, and uh, we had a very good paper actually this morning discussing uh, the virtue of having current account surpluses and GNI bigger than GDP uh, in case of aging population. Uh, so it is, it is often argued that in, uh, in, the, in the case of aging population, it is prudent to save and therefore to have current account surpluses. However, um, what was missing in a way from the discussion this morning is that one could equally make the case that not investing is actually not prudent in a world in which we are living through climate change and the prudent policy in such a world has to do with increasing public investment to realize energy transition now as costs are rising quickly and we are seeing cumulative processes. Otherwise, of course, the bill will be higher later when population is older. So in other words, what we have not talked about in the discussion this morning is that climate debt is actually building up if 
um, public investment is not uh, increased right now uh, to perform energy transition. On top of it, it is now the time to do it because we are living through a period of very low real rate. And here I could have picked other countries, but here is the German gross public investment uh, over time uh, compared to the decrease in 10-year yield and one can see that there is not much uh, price elasticity here uh, in, in this graph. Now, in terms of uh, where we are of macroeconomic stabilization tools to help with the current situation and looking forward, uh, there is an asymmetric game which is played between the ECB, uh, which has a euro-wide objective, while fiscal policy is determined still by perceived national interests. So of course, we are in an equilibrium if which, in which if countries with fiscal space actually do not expand enough, monetary policy has to do and will do the extra mile and is more likely to be at the ELB. So excess burden is placed on the ECB. Loser monetary policy implies countries with fiscal, spa with fiscal space actually perceive even less of a need to expand and therefore as a result, we are in a situation where core countries have a wrong macro policy mix with monetary too loose, fiscal too tight. We do not have a euro area budget for stabilization purposes. We could have had one uh, in the last days, but it just didn't happen. Uh, so we should at least have more transparent, less procyclical fiscal rules compared to the ones we currently have. About that, I will refer you to the CPR 7 and 7 report, which discusses this in, in great detail. But we should also, at least in the spirit of what I just said, have a sizable investment budget for decarbonization, artificial intelligence, research, financed by cyclical revenues, for example, share of corporate taxes, in order to decrease climate debt, etc. So looking forward, this would be the prudent thing to do, and this actually would be counter-cyclical. Now another tool in the panoply that we have looking forward and that could be useful is uh, the macroprudential policy that is, uh, uh, that is deployed at the national level. And provided macroprudential authorities um, put up their countercyclical buffer during economic upturns, gradually building it up with as uh, the literature tends to show now, little effect on activity during the, uh, the upturn, then the buffer can be actually released quickly if credit conditions tighten in a downturn, which is very welcome to reinforce effect of monetary policy easing. So looking forward, in the euro area, macroprudential policies could actually turn out to be also an important tool uh, to fight downturn and credit tightening conditions, further ammunitions. Finally, um, I would like to talk a little bit about sovereignty and drawing here on uh, the uh, speech that Mario Draghi gave in Bologna in 2019, where he said, you know, true sovereignty is reflected not in the power of making laws, as a legal definition would have it, but in the ability to control outcomes and respond to the fundamental needs of the people. Now, if I think about that and apply it to monetary sovereignty, so we can see that to some extent monetary sovereignty is constrained by a number of, uh, of factors. One is the global financial cycle, Fed, the Fed being a key driver. Another one being the current invoicing patterns in the international economy where a uh, pass through from exchange rate to prices is determined by, by invoicing and the dollar is, is very much a dominant currency in invoicing. Another one is the payment system where we have uh, extraterritoriality and issues with the US law there being applied in, in various jurisdictions. And the final one, very important one, being the fragmentation in the euro area with the doom loop, which puts some uh, constraints also on what uh, uh, monetary policy in certain states of the world can actually achieve. So I think if we think about the future of EMU again, part of it will have to be about increasing sovereignty and relaxing some, some of these constraints, starting maybe with the last one. So to conclude, I think, so it's, it's nice to be here for the 20 years of the euro. We have gone a long way since uh, 1999. However, uh, there are lots of important issues facing the EU right now, but we should not uh, you know, lose track that uh, reforms of the euro area are really important and should really be in the agenda in a, in a most pressing way. 
So we have to deal with uh, uh, these uh, imbalances and this is linked to macro stabilization. We have to think about this notion of what is prudent investment, particularly in a time of very low uh, real rate. And in terms of monetary sovereignty, I mean, relaxing those constraints has to do with uh, uh, improving what Gita has, has mentioned in her, in, her, in, her, in her discussion before, improving banking union, um, actually doing capital market union, and uh, the creation also of a safe asset uh, for the euro area. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> and if, if you allow me a personal comment, I'm really glad that you brought back into the discussion the issue of fiscal rules, which seems to have totally vanished away from the European discussion. Uh, both in the academia and in Brussels, actually. Uh, and so we count very much on Niels Tigerson, who's here today to uh, help us one day fix the uh, European fiscal framework, uh, which has uh, so obviously failed. But uh, Marcel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I want to talk about the political economy of EMU and the euro and echo a little bit also what the others have said before and, and focus in particular on the question if monetary union is to succeed, if the euro is to succeed in the long term, it needs legitimacy, it needs credibility, it needs strong institutions. And we should not be taking that legitimacy and credibility for granted. And um, I want to talk in my few minutes of the comments about where I see the risks to that. Um, and I, I want to argue that we need a different narrative uh, for why it is important to complete monetary union, why it is important to do the different reforms, and that we need a positive narrative. And that com it's strengthening the international role of the euro, actually really trying to develop the euro uh, in having a, a truly global role, uh, actually could provide such a positive, constructive narrative that could convince member states uh, to do more to complete the monetary union. And I want to start uh, with uh, paying respect to, to Otmar Ising, who was my, my first boss at um, the European Central Bank. And when I, when I joined, um, I remember he was talking about um, an experience in Germany in the 1960s where polit politicians had attacked the Bundesbank for doing the wrong policy. And they were basically slaughtered in public because the Bundesbank had such strong public support um, that uh, basically um, the politicians committed political suicide. They had no career in the future because they dared to, um, to criticize the, the, the Bundesbank. And uh, you probably remember the quote by um, Jacques Delors who once said, not all Germans believe in God, but all believe uh, in the Bundesbank. And um, I think that, that kind of shows um, that having a high degree of credibility is incredibly important uh, to deliver uh, on the mandate what central banks are supposed to do. And that was one of the, the strengths of the European Central Bank that uh, allowed it also to be so effective uh, in the last 10 years. Now, my three big worries concerning monetary union, but more broadly, um, also economic reforms in Europe, what I would um, describe as three Ps, populism, um, um, protectionism, and paralysis, lack of reform. Uh, Martin Helbig talked a bit about populism, and in Europe, uh, the big worry is that a lot of this populism is an anti-European populism. If something goes right, it's a national responsibility. If something goes wrong, it's Brussels, it's the, um, the, the single market, it's the common rules, it's the euro, it's monetary policy. And um, that, of course, um, so ex exactly the opposite of what I said in this example of the 1960s. Uh, you have the feeling today if politicians want to gain credibility or votes, it's very easy to use or abuse Europe uh, or the euro as a scapegoat for national policy mistakes. Um, I wouldn't underestimate this, and clearly this is not just an issue of a small group, um, but um, when I look at my own country, if you look at the discussion on target two imbalances, you see how far this discussion is going, even among economists, where you get the impression uh, Germany or the Bundesbank has net claims of about, uh, almost 1,000 billion euros. Um, you have some would describe, say, oh, look, this is uh, 5,000 euros for a family of, of four, and if uh, uh, you know, something happens, um, that's what we will lose. So there's this really strong emotionality and um, um, strong negative sentiment to say this is a problem. And um, so I, I, I see these three Ps, in particular this populism, as a major threat uh, to monetary union in the long run, and I, again, I don't think we should underestimate that. Um, 
so far, the narrative for saying, look, we, we need important reforms at the European side, um, the others talked about it on capital market union, banking union, was a lot a negative narrative. In particular, in Berlin, the perception is uh, they want to force the German government to agree to fundamental reforms against their own will. There's a feeling there, there's an attempt to create a transfer union. Uh, so there's a very strong asymmetry who has to, to uh, burden or has to carry the burden. Um, of adjustment, uh, of paying for those reforms, who's taking the risks, example of target two. Um, and so in some sense, it's not surprising that there's a very large reluctance of governments to actually agree, in particular in Berlin, because the feeling is, look, we don't want to be forced or pushed into doing reforms where we are not convinced. Uh, and therefore, um, the illusion that I see in particular in Berlin is this view, time is on our side. If all other national governments would just reform and do the right reforms, everything would be fine and we don't need fundamental reforms in Europe. And I think this is a, a very dangerous illusion. And um, shifting to a positive narrative, um, I think we, we need to, first of all, again, have more of a global perspective. I think we have been engaging in too much navel gazing in Europe. We have forgotten that there is a global competition with Asia, with China, with the United States, who are becoming increasingly affirmative and nationalistic. Um, and that includes also the monetary system. Um, the U.S. has been using the U.S. dollar um, very aggressively, and also now the recent discussions on Iran on the payment system, you see how strong also that can be as a policy tool. China has pushed the renminbi, the international role of the renminbi, very aggressively with some success, uh, clearly since 2015, there was a bit of a weakness. But if you look at the role of the renminbi within Asia, you see that many of the Asian countries actually manage their currencies uh, against the, the renminbi just as much vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar. So in terms of managing the currencies, um, the renminbi already has a regional role. So I think the big choice that Europe will have to make is whether in the future this will be a truly tripolar uh, monetary system, global monetary system with the US dollar, the, the renminbi and the euro, um, or uh, whether the euro will lose. And um, Gita showed the chart on the international role of the euro that comes from the international role of the euro report by the ECB, which is a very informative, very detailed um, an excellent report. Um, and you see this decline in the international role of the euro actually not just since the global financial crisis or the European crisis, but actually before, since the mid 2000s. Um, and I think looking at that, trying to understand what actually is driving that declining role of the international role of the euro is important. Clearly, it has something to do with the relative economic weakness of the euro area at the moment. Um, it also, of course, has to do something with polit political decision making in Europe, but in particular, it has to do. Uh, with the fact that monetary union is, is not completed or not complete as it should be to really give the international role of the euro a bigger role, a, a truly global status. And Helen, uh, Martin, and Gita talked about some of the elements. Um, our report of the 14 economists, the French and German economists last year, and we had a shorter update this year, underlined that and said, look, uh, to complete monetary union, we don't need this big, big change. We don't need political union. We need a set of really what we believe fairly realistic reforms uh, on capital market union, on banking union, uh, creating a common safe asset. And you can go into detail how specifically that look, should look like. But clearly, it is important uh, to have a, a common safe asset on fiscal policy, not just to have uh, fiscal rules that make sense, that are more counter cyclical and give uh, governments more space. Uh, but also we need uh, both on the macroeconomic stabilization, a better buffer against <coughs> asymmetric shocks, and also more of a common uh, fiscal policy stance in Europe um, to help convergence, to help integration, uh, and um, 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 make financial markets uh, deeper. So I think these are some of the more, uh, important reforms to push ahead. And, and um, my key argument is we, we should really think more of a positive narrative to convince governments in Berlin and Paris, elsewhere, to say, why is it actually so important to complete monetary union? And it's not just that you, know, you need to do it, because otherwise you'll be sorry later on. But there is substantial potential uh, for the euro. And the big economic benefits through uh, much better financing conditions, deeper capital markets, more stability, in particular when a crisis hits. So the, the economic benefits from, from having a strong global currency <coughs> are very clear. Uh, again, in an increasingly polarized world, I think it is very important to have uh, an international role of, a stronger international role of the euro uh, to transform it into a truly tripolar global currency system. 
um, so to prevail in that monetary system. And I think that also would go a long way uh, in strengthening the, the legitimacy of the euro, um, giving the ECB more, again, full uh, de facto monetary independence to act. Um, and um, um, it would kind of take also the pressure of the European Central Bank to do uh, what um, um, yeah, to, to stabilize where it's clear uh, national governments need to do more, both on the fiscal side, uh, on macroprudential policies, uh, to stabilize the euro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, thank you for adv advertising the year. ECB report on the International Road of the Euro, which you can download on the ECB website. Um, we have uh, 25 minutes or so for a discussion, which is, uh, which is ample enough. Uh, and before uh, opening the, um, the discussion to the audience, I would like to ask the panelists if they have want to come back on any issue or comment on each other uh, before we open more broadly. So it's just an option I'm giving. <laughs> Martin? Uh, I want to make a remark on public investment. Mm -hmm. I haven't talked about that. I fully share the view. Yesterday, in response to so in, in seeing uh, the picture that uh, Markus had on the uh, Franco-German divide with the Rhine in between and then there was a bridge, my comment was a lack of public investment or paucity of public investment in Germany is making the bridges across the Rhine fall apart. And that's actually true, literally. The bridge on the Autobahn, the highway, that crosses the Rhine north of Cologne, which is the major highway from northern France and Belgium mm -hmm. into uh, the core of Germany, is no longer passable for trucks. And they haven't just prevented the passing, they have introduced traps to make sure that the trucks don't cross it, because there is a fear that it'll it'll fall apart. To the south of Cologne, they've just put up signs, trucks no longer allowed. Uh, I think the, the phrase catches uh, the problem. I also think, and this, this was very much at the back of my mind when I said, I don't just want to have a European budget which is, distributes money. I think we should think very, in very concrete terms about joint ventures that induce public spending at the EU level with the fiscal capacity at the EU level and that can deal with, well, both useful purposes and to some extent fiscal equalization without any newspaper ever noticing it. If I think, for instance, about something like protection of the borders, it's clear that this is something that we need it's also clear that this is something where a lot of the spending would um, be, of, of the money would be spent in the Mediterranean countries for very simple reasons. I much prefer uh, moving in such concrete terms where you talk about what is it that we need rather than grand principles of risk sharing and stabilization because those grand principles can easily give rise to too much controversy. Those were the two points I have in response. Thank you very much. Ellen? Yeah, can I, can I just sure. re reinforce that? So, in, so indeed, this is a wonderful metaphor, that, that bridge falling down in between <laughs> France and, and Germany. And uh, was I, when I was applying the um, public good uh, example, collective investment in terms of uh, climate change, uh, evidently, so if we think about, uh, you know, the, the, the costs are, are rising if we wait and, uh, and if we want to meet our target, which is uh, pretty much also a survival issue we have to, to get going now, that's, that's clearly prudent policy. 
uh, but uh, to some extent, investment in infrastructure shares some of these features as well. If you let things fall down, it's a lot more costly to rebuild later uh, when your population is aging <laughs> or uh, when you have, uh, you have less resources. Uh, and we can think of a number of collective goods, indeed, uh, where uh, if we had a, a fiscal investment capacity, uh, we could put money indeed to, uh, to good use, and that would have some stabilization effect, which is also the point that I was trying to make uh, when I was discussing that in the context of, of climate change. Thank you. I've just one sentence. Yeah, sure. The problem is, of course, political economy with an aging population. Together with the prohibition on debt finance, meaning finance by those who, who will end up benefiting who are not involved in today's decision processes. I think that plays a major role. Okay. So let me open the floor now. We'll take, I'll take uh, uh, questions by three by three to try to uh, uh, not overburden the, uh, the, the speaker. So let me start with uh, Sylvester. Yes, thank you, Benoit. Uh, <clears throat> as I'm one of the few Dutchmen left, Klaas Knot has left, and uh, so I feel very alone, but uh, I think I have to not justify, but explain the Dutch position. You know, General de Gaulle once said, tous les bataves sont des calvinistes. Uh, let me translate, so all the Dutchmen are Calvinists, even in the South where they're Catholic. And that's true, that's true. Uh, uh, Dutchmen uh, try to see surpluses, current or su count surplus, now in the Netherlands, is 10% and increasing, increasing. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I don't say that is justified. I try to explain the position of the Dutch and especially the Minister of Finance uh, he gave uh, a lecture at the Humboldt University beginning of May and he tried to explain his position and the position was that there are rights and duties. It's a very normative approach to European integration, I agree. And what he, I would say the Dutch government, I should speak about the Dutch government, has a perspective is that of course, there are current account surpluses of Germany and uh, the Netherlands, and there is no public investment, like uh, Martin said. Not in the in physical infrastructure, not in the human infrastructure, digitization, artificial intelligence, and all that stuff. And actually, I pleaded for that many years already. But the idea is that the Dutch government, and maybe also the German government, see that as a kind of bargaining chip for the other countries, well, Italy, maybe France, to exchange structural reforms. It's a kind of, well, power play or tit for tat, or how you want to call it, that they are, <clears throat> I think, prepared to invest, but uh, they want to, for in, in exchange, also structural reforms. And maybe, maybe it would be possible, this is a coordination problem. This is really a coordination problem on a macroeconomic, on a European level. Maybe we could have, you know, for the next European Commission, and a new, uh, that we can go to the next level, that we can solve this problem in the interest of European integration. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Here. Thank you very much indeed. I would say that the exposition were wonderful and the list of uh, reform is impressive. I would personally uh, underwrite absolutely all what you have said. Uh, let me only mention uh, that we had also done a lot of reforms in the most recent period, in the second two years. I'm speaking under the control of Mario, the setting up by a treaty of the ESM with an enormous amount of callable capital, more than 700 billion euros. Uh, we have the macroeconomic imbalance procedure starting from scratch. We have the banking union that Mario mentioned as one of the most important reform. We have the fiscal compact. All this has been done recently, so I, I would draw our attention to the fact that it's a historic project. 
that it takes a little time nevertheless. And when I look at the US, the Coinage Act, uh, dated 1792, uh, matured a lot <laughs> until there was the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, so 120 years. And since 1913, of course, we have also 106 years. So I, I would draw our attention to the fact that it's a historic process which takes necessarily a little time. A lot has to be done. A lot has been done in the most recent years. And on the international uh, currency, I will again, uh, underline what has been already said, uh, the absence of uh, capital market union, the absence of real banking union is terrible. It was said also by, by Mario and by all of you, because we do not have the market that would be uh, deep and liquid as is required. So we, we have a very good performance in terms of global payment currency. These figures are not known, but they are in the report you mentioned, Benoit, uh, with 40% uh, for the US and 35% for the Euro. So we are very close. Where we are desperately behind is when markets are concerned, and then very low level of uh, Forex uh, proportion for, uh, for the Euro in comparison with the dollar, one third. One third of Forex and one third in international debt denomination. So there is a big difference. Uh, between the potential and the reality. Thank you so much, Jean-Claude, for being positive. I, I somehow fear that the conference will end with the image of a crumbling bridge between France and Germany, which are, <laughs> would have been pretty depressive. But um, there are solid bridges between France and Germany uh, and, and other countries. So, so thank you, Jean-Claude. Uh, Shaheen Vallée, and then we'll go back to the panel. Thank you. I had a, a question about the, the fiscal framework, which was somehow the common thread between many of the, of the presentations. Hélène talked about safe asset without saying who was going to issue the safe asset. Martin talked about the fact that we don't really have a resolution authority, in part because we don't have anybody to deliver liquidity and, um, and, and, and solvency uh, in instruments. And Gopina mentioned the central uh, uh, fiscal authority. Um, we, we seem to be in a framework where we don't have a euro area budget, and we're maybe not going to have one anytime soon. Um, we don't have the second best, which would be the coordination of national fiscal policies, because we don't have an effective coordination framework. And so we're left in the third best, which is um, fiscal rules that we are not following, and a form of chaos where every member state does as, it, as much as it can to, to deliver some level of stabilization. And so I, I was curious to, to ask the panelists, what do you think would be a, a, an ideal form of euro area uh, budget? Uh, yesterday, Mario Draghi mentioned that even if we didn't have one immediately, the commitment of European governments to have something at some stage would be enormously powerful. Do you believe that the agreement we had last week in the Eurogroup amounts to that commitment? And if not, what do we need to change to have that sort of medium-term commitment? Thank you, Shaheen. Back to the panelists. And then we'll have, we'll have, we'll have other rounds of questions, so don't worry about that. Be patient. Uh, yeah. Gita, you want yeah. to start? Um, so on the, uh, the fiscal rules and how much success there was of uh, from the Eurogroup meeting a week ago. I, mean, I think it's fair to say that, the, that there was uh, you know, probably great intent and some progress, but, but a lot to be done. Uh, and this is both in terms, you know, there, there wasn't a clear agreement about the size of the budget, what that would be. Um, the emphasis continues to be on um, support for competitiveness and structural reforms, which is a good thing. Uh, but there's also a need for macro stabilization, uh, and that, that has to be done. So this will be on the wish list, and of course it always seems very ambitious, and the question is whether that will ever come about. But, but more narrowly in terms of just the fiscal rules for now, uh, I would say that maybe what could be done, and I can't see why it shouldn't be, uh, is the simplification of the fiscal rules, uh, and making it more you know, transparent, more clear what the, what the escape clauses are, it's fairly complicated at this time, and I, I would put that out as something that can be done. Thank you. Martin? Two responses. First one to uh, Jean-Claude Trichet. I didn't say that nothing has been done. 
I fully appreciate that a lot has been done. The one reservation I have about the process is that quite often there's been too much belief in the power of labels and too little analysis. In the case of resolution, this phrase, never again will taxpayers be involved, <laughs> dominated the political discussion. And anyone who understands the subject knows it's not true. Uh, one moved away, well, one consciously, and I know this because I talked to people involved in the negotiations and said, you must do, do with this, deal with this. One consciously avoided the problem of liquidity because it would have been politically unpalatable. I think the willingness to engage in compromise in order to get somewhere, well, that's fine. But then to say we've solved the problem, if you know that a major part of the problem has not been solved, that's dishonest. And then to move on to capital market union as though it was the natural complement to banking union, when banking union was something that was needed to solve problems in an existing sector that was essential for monetary policy, and capital market union is intended to solve the problem that a certain sector isn't really there. With no concern about the heterogeneity of the underlying legal infrastructures in the different member states, think about German co-determination and, and stock market law, uh, takeover law. I mean, there, there are lots of things affecting capital markets that would have to be addressed. Uh, but of course, capital, this wonderful label never was meant that way. And I'm concerned about the fact that even in the progress of the negotiations, we've had too much of that kind of hiding things for basically the purpose of media success. On the question of the fiscal, fiscal authority, that really raises the problem of political legitimacy. A sort of narrow avenue that I could see would be that for some of the purposes that we've introduced, one creates specialized agencies, gives these specialized agencies funding from a formal procedure that's well established, well, that, ne that needs to be well codified, and let them proceed on that basis. There are many examples of that uh, in uh, different countries. The moment you go to an institution that gets the power to raise money and gets discretion over what it's going to do with it, you need parliamentary involvement. And that, of course, which I think is extremely desirable, requires a major, way, a, a major change in the way the EU operates. Marcel? Um, maybe to, to point on the first question on investment. Um, yes, of course, there's a focus on public investment, which is right. We have too low public investment. but. We shouldn't forget that private investment is a lot more important than public investment. 90% of all investment is private, uh, and we have equally as for the public sector, we have really a, a deficient private sector investment, uh, companies investing too little. Clearly, there's a complementarity between public investment and private investment, but all I'm trying to say is um, if you talk about private investment and how to push that, we need to think of completing the single market for services, having common standards, uh, deregulating, uh, having more competition. If you look at Germany, the, the big reason for the huge current account surplus um, comes from uh, the services sectors, comes from having too little investment in that se sector, therefore too little imports, and, and therefore uh, a very high current account surplus. Uh, so really focusing on private investment, I would, would add, is very important. And the second point on public investment, um, it's a lot more complicated than saying, look, the government needs to spend more. If you take Germany, Germany has a federalist structure. More than half of all public investment is done at the municipal level, at the local level. And we have 30% of local municipalities that are over indebted, that don't have the ability to spend. So thinking about the federalism, uh, federalist structure, both within countries, but, but also within Europe, 
uh, I would say is very important. And that brings me to, to the issue of a, of a budget. And we have uh, the European, the EU budget, 40% of which are structural funds, 40% roughly is the, the cap, the common agriculture policy. And there's a lot of scope. Um, I mean, we're talking about 150 billion over seven years, so it's not a huge amount, but still uh, there is a budget. And I think we should also think about how, you, how to use that money uh, more sensibly uh, for, for instance, uh, issues of public investment and also to, to help trigger convergence. Thank you, uh, Marcel. Hélène? Yeah. Uh, so briefly, I just wanted to... Uh, briefly, yeah. Yeah, very briefly. So, so on the safe asset, so true that on the payment side, there has been a rise. Now, if we want to go further and, you know, think about the reserve currency, etc. So clearly, there, what, uh, what happens during uh, global crisis time is very important. And so we have this weakness of a doom loop within the euro area that we really should fix, because precisely when there is a big shock and that you need the safe asset to be resilient, is the time where it's just not working in the EU area. So for the sake of financial stability and also for the sake of the international role of the euro, that should be one number one on the agenda. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me allow for another round of questions. Uh, so there will be many of you who won't have an opportunity to ask your questions, and I take the entire blame. That's exactly my job. Uh, so let me uh, give the floor exactly in chronological order. So start is with, starting with Yanis uh, Stornars. Thank you. Uh, it was uh, an excellent discussion. Um, I'd like uh, to pose a question regarding the relationship between banking union, particularly the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, and Capital Markets Union. I, I have seen certain arguments recently that if we, if we achieve a perfect capital market union, then we don't need a European Deposit Insurance Scheme. In my view, this is wrong. Uh, I, we need both. Um, the, uh, we cannot have a substitute. Uh, in the form of a capital market union for European deposit insurance scheme. Uh, but I'd like to have the views of the panel on that. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, Hydro Huang. Uh, I want to provide a quick comment on RMB internationalization and then uh, propose a suggestion for the panel to consider on how to, uh, you know, uh, uh, enlarge the safe asset. I think that uh, several one, uh, you know, Elaine and uh, also Martin talk about that. Uh, Renminbi internationalization has not, uh, you know, gone very far. One, you know, as you can tell, I'm the only representative from China. If Renminbi, that's, that's uh, you know, that's, uh, is, is, it, you know, I think that uh, there is a long way to go. China's sitting on three trillion US dollar reserves. The market estimate of that is about 70% in US dollar. I think China would be more than happy to invest one trillion in euro. But of course, that uh, you know is, is related to Elaine's question. Uh, you know, euro. I think that uh, the safe asset. There is a shortage of, of that in euro in big amount in liquidity, and also that uh, I think that they need to generate this, a higher return, nominal return. You know, say it's German bond zero return, a negative. I think that uh, for PPOC to hold a, a trillion of that sitting negative return that's, doesn't look very good. So, so I think that uh, in a way that uh, to massively increase uh, safe return uh, with a positive nominal uh, you know, uh, interest rate, that's vitally important. So here's my proposal for, for the panelists to consider. Of course, that, uh, you know, both Martin and uh, Elen and others talk about uh, the uh, lack of public investment. How about uh, you basically that, uh, ask EIB or EBRD to issue massive amount of bond and the ECB to provide some credit enhancement? And the PBOC can buy one trillion US dollars right out of that. So that's, that's, that's one suggestion. The second suggestion, of course, I think that the ECB will also need to, need to be prepared for a big crisis, not in your area, in, in global, you know, I think. The, when the, the next big crisis is coming out, I'm not sure whether the Fed is ready. So may, maybe we need another version of do whatever it will take internationally, whether ECB is ready for that. I think that uh, Renminbi is not ready for that yet. If China and uh, if PBOC and P ECB can collaborate on that, I think that that would uh, probably help save the world. And uh, hopefully the Fed will come along. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I mean, note that we do have a swap line between the ECB and PBOC, which is a, can be the start of, of that discussion. Uh, yes, please, in the back, yes. Christian Keller from Barclays. A very a straightforward question. This is a, a panel of the, about the future of the European Monetary Union. And I just wonder whether there's still ambition to actually grow it. You know, there's still a, a lot of EU countries uh, that are presumed, I assume, at some point to, to join. And uh, obviously, this process has come to a hold. 
And uh, you know, in financial markets, that was all the, you know, the talk uh, before the crisis about which country would be uh, next to join and you know, the, the kind of convergence that would take place. And I wonder whether you believe, given the problems that we have, right now it's better to wait and keep countries maybe waiting for longer and, and deal with the, all the issues that we defined already, or whether one should continue to press on and invite more countries and, and encourage uh, new countries to join. Thank you. Let me take two more questions, uh, and that will be it, given the time constraints. So that's Kristen Forbes and uh, Michael Borda. Kristen Forbes from MIT. So many of the reforms that have come up again on this panel, as well as the last day and a half, have been things like fiscal policy, migration, things that central bankers can't do too much about. Given that this is a room dominated by central bankers, especially in Europe, are there any specific reforms you'd mention for them that the people in this room can do more about? Um, one example, in the US, there's a big discussion now on changing the mandate of the Fed. Should those types of issues or anything else be on the table, given the audience here? Michael Bird of Humboldt University. I have a related question. Um, given that Europe as a whole can't coordinate fiscal policy, wouldn't it be a good idea to do something like uh, Helmut Schmidt, uh, Giscard d'Estaing meeting and deciding to, to do something bilaterally and asking other European countries if they want to join in. I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking of fixing all those bridges across the Rhine. That would cost several billion. And then the second thing would be to get rid of the second parliament in Strasbourg and turn it into a European Institute of Technology in the sense of MIT. Why couldn't Europe do that? I mean, there are enough French, smart French people and a lot of smart French German people who, who could get together and take over this capital stock in Strasbourg and make it into a serious university, which Europe has been looking for for a long time. So I won't step in that minefield, but I'm happy to listen to the answer, so please. <laughs> yeah, well, if you want to. Um, not into that minefield, but uh, on some of the other questions that uh, came up. So clearly, the you know, banking union and capital markets, you know, these are not substitutes. Uh, they absolutely don't substitute for each other. You can have a, a very good capital markets union in the US is an example of that, but you, at the same time you need a banking union. Uh, you know, the, uh, a capital market union is not going to insure you against uh, runs on banks or against uh, liquidity crisis in the banking sector. And, and, uh, and so not having a com common deposit insurance uh, scheme it would, be, would, be, uh, would be a mistake. Um, to, the question, uh, to Kristen's question about uh, why are we talking about everything that's not monetary policy, I think the way I would say it is that uh, uh, we're trying to make the job of monetary policy makers easier a little bit <laughs> by saying that uh, it would be really helpful if these other mechanisms were in, uh, in place. Uh, you know, I, think, I think there's been a lot of innovation on monetary policies that have happened over the last uh, decade. Uh, and while there certainly has been more uh, progress also on other fronts, I think that the most important ones are where countries can have greater resilience to shocks that don't necessarily rely entirely on monetary uh, policy tools. And I'll stop with that. Martin? On this issue of our banking union and capital union substitutes or not, I have a, the following wrinkle. In 2015, there were substitutes. Because when the new commission came in and, and said, we've dealt with banking union, now let's talk about capital, union, capital markets union. That meant that for a few years, banking union was off the agenda. In terms of political energy that can be devoted to subjects, there is a budget constraint. And, and there I thought that the displacement of endeavors to think about banking union by concerns about capital market union, which to some extent had to do with promoting interests of the city, trying to make EU attractive for the UK and things like that. Uh, that was a mistake. In particular, since if you look at the actual measures that were being talked about, it was piecemeal a little bit here, a little bit there, but uh, nothing that would get at the fundamental reasons for why we don't have wonderful uh, capital markets. On the safe asset, real safety, I think, would require fiscal capacity. 
and would require the discretion to adapt taxation to, uh, if necessary, the need to pay one's debt. And we are far removed from that. The various proposals for safe assets, such as ESPYs, are devices to get around that, but they all have sort of little pieces of lack of safety that are problematic, and ultimately their functioning will depend on the ECB's willingness to buy the stuff. Which brings me to the observation that at some level, the arrangement we have under QE already has some version of ESPYs, namely the different national banks buy in fixed proportion, in the proportion of the paid in capital share of uh, the different uh, national central banks. Having said that, I would like to draw attention to the fact that we, that in introducing QE, there's been a step back from the um, sort of communism in terms of income, income accounting, by having each national bank buy its own government debt under uh, a rule that allows it to keep the interest on that debt, to bear the risk associated with that debt, so that the extent to which that debt is treated as part of the common income of the central banks in the system is very much reduced. Now, that's a form of ESPY, which in terms of thinking of the ECB, or rather the euro system, as a supranational institution, which is one whole, is actually a step backward. And I remember uh, Peter making a critical comment about this when it was, to, to, to me in conversation, when it was introduced. On the other hand, and this uh, illustrates the conflict where we are, having this rule, means that potential exit incentives are unaffected by QE. Because if you think about the real incentives for exit, a government that wants, wants to uh, leave, what do they have to gain? What do they have to lose? They lose their share in euro system profits, and they gain the assets that they withdraw from the uh, euro system. Now, the difference between those two is neutral to QE under uh, the procedure that has been followed. Uh, and I've been discussing this with uh, a number of people. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I see pros and cons, but very definitely the splitting up and treating these uh, acquisitions as if they were each national central bank's own business except for the fact that it's under the control of the euro system, is a step back. Thank you, Martin. You know, QE is a monetary instrument, right? So whether it's a good thing or a bad thing from a fiscal standpoint uh, yes. is not really the point. Yep. Marcel? Um, just two, two comments also. One way, I, I think I wouldn't agree that QE um, has an element of SBs, but um, I want to answer two, two questions. One is by Michael Bourdin, and the other one, Christine Forbes. Um, you know, when we started this group of 14 economists, French and German, our thought was exactly the same thing. They're different views, and you know, they, in a way they're compatible, they're not contradictions, but they're two sides of the same coin. Now, thinking back, uh, I think it's very important to be more inclusive. I think it's actually not a good idea to have it to, to narrow it down to two countries. Um, and there are actually a lot of proposals on European universities, excellence universities by President Macron. So, so there are some proposals out there, and I think it, it, I agree with you, it would be good to move in that direction. On Christine's question on the, on the, on the mandate or on the reforms, um, I do think uh, we need to have that discussion about the mandate, what central banks should be doing. I think the, the result would be not so different 
from what central banks do today. But I think, again, for the issue of legitimacy, to say, look, we, we are looking at that issue. It is important. We need to really think very hard about uh, a changing global environment, financial stability having become a lot more important uh, for central banks than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, for me, the question is, what's the right timing? And you probably want to do that discussion and those reforms uh, when, things, when, 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 when there's smooth sailing, so when things are, are relatively calm. Um, and if I, if I may, uh, one comment to Olivier Blanchard on, on Monday evening. Uh, I, I actually would think that it's actually very dangerous in, in, in times when you still have zero interest rates, when it's difficult to achieve price stability, to move up the inflation targets. Um, so talking about credibility, uh, I think you really want to do this reforms about man or discussion about the mandate of central banks in good times, when things are, are well and uh, not rock the boat when it's difficult. Hélène, you have the last word. I just wanted to uh, briefly add to the answer to, to Hai Zhou. So uh, the safe asset uh, proposals come in many different flavors. So we discussed SBs, which are about you know, uh, putting together national debt and then somehow tranching. Uh, but there's also some alternative views, which could be that the ESM, a body you didn't actually cite, could, could also issue debt. But of course, uh, the devil is in the details. And then you have to think about a, a lot of issues about implementation, seniority, etc. Uh, but definitely, this all should be in, in the agenda. Thank you, Hélène. I've been instructed to catch up on the late uh, start of this session, which I'm doing uh, diligently. So I. Uh I guess it's time to uh, hand the floor back to Christine Greif and to the President. Thank you very much to all speakers and thank you for your questions.